Hey, ladies and germs. How you doing today? Guess what? Today is your lucky day because it's time for the third installment of third rate, second wave, third wave, second rate Norwegian black metal bands for you to enjoy. Been liking doing the series. Uh, it's been a lot of fun kind of choosing bands who deserves to be in this little niche echelon of notoriety all determined by me and ultimately it doesn't matter all that much anyways i've been enjoying it hope you've been enjoying it let me know if you have any other ideas uh i think i have a pretty good list for three four five maybe more videos ahead of this one so today anyways we're going to be listening to the infamous into the woods of belial demo Recorded in 1991 by a 16- and 17-year-old uh, future members of Emperor. This is Thou Shalt Suffer. This is a compilation of demos, actually, put out by Nocturnal Art Productions in 1997. Uh, Ishan Isan later used this name to release a... Uh, solo symphonic ambient kind of record uh that wasn't so hot so if you weren't aware that thou shalt suffer is uh good death metal stuff from the 90s there you go you're welcome so today we've got five bands to talk about from norway really good and not the norwegian bands that everyone else is always talking about that's what this is we'll get uh this one out of the way Bac de Sivfjell, uh, which means Behind the Seven Mountains in Norwegian. And this refers to, in the city of Bergen, there are seven mountains nearby that are very beloved. Um, so this is a 7-inch released in 1997 uh, by uh, Einar, I can't remember his whole name, but better known as Kvitrofen from uh, Vardruna, Gorgoroth. Jotunspor, a uh, bunch of cool projects, and a guy named Havard, not from Louver. So, this is a two track, seven inch, released in 1997, in limitation of 1,000 copies. And it is great, it sounds pretty much like a continuation, in my opinion, of Ulver's Berktat record, uh, and it's fucking great. You can probably pick this up for more than $20. I got this recently on the cheap because it's kind of beat up, but I kind of don't care. Um, just really wanted to have it and didn't really want to pay a lot of money for it. Um, thankfully, though, it was reissued on CD in, I think, 2009 by uh, some label. Look it up. Uh, better artwork. And there's also an additional band photo in here. This might be the shortest CD I own. It's just the two tracks from the 7-inch released on CD. It's it's that great that it's worth getting it on CD. Um, there are some rehearsal tracks of Buck DC Fiel. Um, and they have four songs that aren't on this. And one that is, as far as I know. Um... And they're fucking awesome. Highly recommended stuff. Uh, if you're into that first Ulver record, uh, you definitely will not be led astray. Um, the only thing is all the vocals are clean vocals. Lots of choral vocals like uh, the very first Ulver record. Although that record had a little bit of the nasty, raspy kind of stuff. Uh, but really wish that band would put out some more stuff. That's just one of the biggest bums ever about Norwegian music. Next we've got kind of an oddity here. I don't think a lot of people know about Twin Obscenity or talk about Twin Obscenity. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think either of these records are on vinyl. Um, this is the first one. If I'm not mistaken, they only have the two full lengths. Uh, but this one is more of note. I like this a little bit more than the other one. Where the Light Touches None. Uh, this is just a very bizarre melding pot of different styles 
and it never really struck me until I was listening to this uh, a couple of months ago how influenced this must have been by the almighty Master's Hammer. Uh, this sounds quite a bit like Master's Hammer with those weird sort of diabolical big melody riffs going on and kind of just like mid-tempo sort of stuff. Um, I guess what they were going for stylistically was sort of a Viking kind of thing. Uh, Head Not Found put out this album in... Right, every time I look, I swear to you, it doesn't have the year on it. I'm going to go ahead and say 95, probably. Um, it's got quite a few songs on it. It's a great listen. You should be able to pick this up really, really, really cheap. And then we have the Century Media debut for Blood, Honor, and Soul. Soil? For Blood, Honor, and Soil. Uh, this is way further into the uh, more Bathory-influenced Viking style. Uh, it's not bad. It's just there's a lot of other bands doing this pretty much the same kind of thing. Um, but if you're interested in something uh, that would... You know, whet your appetite for something like Inherior or Enslaved. This should definitely do it for you. Um, Milwaukee Metal Fest brought these guys over for a show in uh, 99, I think. And I think it was in support of this record because it came out in 98. It has the year on it. How about that? Artwork by Chris Verwimp. Uh, you know. Not a whole lot to write home about, but it's pretty decent and solid. Um, really, its only fault is that it came out at the time that there were a lot of other bands doing pretty much exactly the same thing. By no fault of their own. Next, we've got, speaking of Emperor, how about Tartaros, the Grand Psychotic Castle? Trying to, trying to really get better at not angling my glare right into the camera. But this EP is tremendous. Symphonic black metal if you take maybe the kind of the arch type or the prototype of uh of summoning and made it a lot more musically developed a lot more orchestral and a lot more symphonic uh you would have something i think quite a bit like this he's not afraid to use the drum machine or the the keyboards to recreate a symphonic orchestral kind of instrumentation uh, and I like that about it. It's It's got sort of a, a classiness about it. These songs are really memorable and great. Um, and his talent showed when he played keyboards for uh, Emperor. That was the Emperor connection there. So Charmin Grimlock definitely, uh, I think, probably had a lot to do with uh, influencing Emperor to be a lot more symphonic when they did their Anthems to the Woken at Dusk album uh after this one was released he did a couple of tracks for the tribute to hell two cd set that full moon productions put out under the name the thrill and uh those are very weird and pretty interesting especially uh, being my fandom for this ep what it is um so if you're nuts about tartaros and you don't know about the thrill check that out uh i think they're probably on YouTube or something, but I don't think he ever did anything else under the name The Thrill. But then he did a follow-up full-length album called The Red Jewel, also on Necropolis. Uh, this is pretty great. Uh, I think it's just a, maybe a little bit too dense. Um, it's it's quite a thing to, to swallow. It's kind of a hard thing to listen to all the way through. Uh, it's intense. It's got just packs so much music in such a little uh, area. It's kind of a uh, for nerds only kind of thing. Came out in 1999 and uh, uh, stylistically I'd say it kind of, it is a little bit more developed, kind of like Emperor developed their style. Um, you can kind of hear some similarities to the Nine Equilibrium album in a way, so it's kind of a little bit more grandiose like that album was. Uh, but it's still uh, not shying away from sounding um, synthetic with its orchestration. 
let's see what have we got next in my last video I believe it was Eli dark hymns from the cold north uh, commented underneath how about limbonic art well I didn't respond to that comment because how about limbonic art um, we'll start with their debut moon and the Scorpio uh, so this is a two-piece band as far as I know they were always a two-piece um, and famously they were kind of the first band I think anyways to pull off a uh, symphonic black metal style with a drum machine again unapologetically using the synthetic instrumentation of a drum machine and I think used it to their advantage you could also say noticing I have something behind the tray card here what is this Ooh. so this was a really surprising debut uh, nocturnal art Samoth's label put this out originally back then great booklet here um, I did buy that original version back in the day but I think I wound up getting rid of it for some stupid reason so this I think is a uh, reissued version and it's fine black metal attack records yeah it looks like black metal attack is actually a subsidiary of evil horde records who the other day I mentioned only puts out mediocre music um, this has a bonus track on it, and I never noticed that. The Dark Rivers of the Heart is on this. And I wonder what the origin of that track is. That's interesting. Um, these guys have a lot of good albums. I think a lot of people who are into Limbonic Art feel like they have a pretty great discography. And um, I also used to have In Abhorrence Dementia, which I think was the follow-up to this one. Um, I didn't like it, I guess, at first, and I kind of would like to have another copy of it back. Again, uh, they did a couple other albums. I don't really have all of their discography, but this is the Ultimate Death Worship. This was one of their comeback albums. They always kind of like had a hiatus or something, and they would come back, and there would be a little bit of fanfare. Um, and this, I think, was really the, the last point where I'm willing to give them a shot. Um, this one is pretty good. They're kind of dropping the symphonic aspects and going a little bit more for the throat with the... Um, intensity I guess um, and I think maybe incidentally wind up sounding quite a bit like Immortal on this record so I was pretty pleased to hear that on this album um, but the other albums that came out after this maybe one or two of them not worth your time in my humble opinion just uh, just some stuff there this also was on Black Market Attack I think Black Metal Attack I think that label put out or reissued three or four or maybe even five of their full lengths, probably just on CD. Uh, I don't think Limbonic Art managed to make it to wax very often. I think there's maybe like a four or five LP box set that they had. And there's a really cool three or four CD set of their first couple of records. And those are really cool. Um, additionally, though, this is the... Uh, Rehearsal. So, uh, Kirk Productions, which is a label I really like and talk about quite a bit on this channel, uh, reissued two different releases, and I'm, they're kind of confusing, so I'll try and inform you as best I can. This is the only one that I have. I'd like to have the other one, of course, uh, but this is Rehearsal 1995 and Rehearsal 1996, and I believe the other disc is just one rehearsal from 1996 as well. I don't know if they share the same songs or whatnot, but I'm sure it's pretty much diehard kind of stuff. Um, and I didn't get this because I'm a diehard Limbonic Art fan, but I listened to them and I found them to be intensely haunting, just like their music pretty much is on their debut. But um, the, the more unstructured atmosphere going on here, the more uh, basement sort of production and recording quality on this just lends a lot of atmosphere to the already really great music going on here so i really recommend getting this 95 96 disc this has 79 minutes of rehearsal material on it uh there also were vinyl editions of both of those albums and i want to say i think one of the lps had more material on them than the cds did uh, and that kind of irked me 
Um, but there's a bunch of old photos in here and stuff too. These Kirk Productions releases, man, they're they're really great. They do a great job, I think, of kind of capturing the aesthetic in their booklets of old labels, especially like they kind of remind me of old Malicious Records releases. They put in all kinds of stuff in there, and they really do a good job of just like including as much stuff as they could possibly gather up for their releases. And I just really appreciate. Um, how they put that much work into their releases. So, Labonic Art, that is them. That brings us to one of my all-time favorite bands. That is, of course, Red Boy and Zenda. This is not their first release, but this is great. So, this is the reissue of their demo tape. Their demo tape was called Those Who Caress the Pale, and it came out in 93. Three, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and it was kind of a experimentation. It was definitely not traditional black metal for its time or really ever. Um, this was two or three guys doing something very, very, very original and and trying to deconstruct the music or the intentions of Ed and Zenda is something I've really pondered and still ponder to this day quite a bit. My Instagram name is Carrier of Wounds, and that comes from that song right there. So this is a misanthropy reissue of their demo tape. Comes in this cool little uh, jewel box. I don't know if you can see that black artwork on there, but this is a really cool thing. Actually, Ancient Lore Creations also put this out with misanthropy. Uh, but yeah. Um, Going just completely in a different direction as most metal was for its time. Um, not pursuing anything like blasphemy or brutality or intensity, really. Uh, this stuff is just way more melancholic and uh, untraditional. And I think really trying to just break some new ground in the genre. Which is something I think not a lot of the early... Norwegian guys were doing at that time. They were so young and it was such a burgeoning time for the genre that I think it speaks a lot to how um, I guess how much credit this band deserves. Um, so after they did that demo, they did this full length written in waters and it is absolutely phenomenal. It's some of the most adventurous I think vocal work that any black metal band has ever done that I've heard anyways um, it's super ingenuitive in that regard and the way that the vocals just harmonize with the guitar work which is already really crazy and dissonant and kind of off time purple kind of marbled vinyl I hope that shows up well never understood why this is like the one misanthropy release that doesn't have center labels at all you don't see that very often uh, on any label. But uh, got to hang out with this guy last October, and that was quite a treat. Um, I didn't want to bug him and, and pick his brain so much about this record in particular. I kind of just kind of like letting this album and this band um, stay what it is in my head, in a, in a way, you know? Um, this is a very special record to me. So, Ved Boyne's End, Bitten in Waters. It's great. Um, here's the CD edition of it, too. Also, Misanthropy. Pretty much just looks exactly like the uh, LP, only the disc art is the same thing as on this jewel box. And then, um, they did a little uh, reissue. Kirk Productions, again, did a nice job reissuing the demo tape with some pre- Ved Buen's End uh, rehearsal tracks. Um, Yusuf Parvez, um, Vikotnik, is his name in the band, um, had a project of his own called Manes, um, who is not the same band that I played in my last video, but had the same name. Um, he had a couple tracks under that name. The demo is called Pronosis Diabolus, and those tracks are included on here, and I just, the collector in me had to have it. So, that is that. 
check out Bedborn's End if you're looking for something absolutely, completely original. This band just, to me, defines how original metal can be. I think if you told someone you were listening to, you were a metalhead, and they said, Sit, play me some of that metal, and you were to play Bedborn's End, I think they would, most people who don't know, the uh, far reaches of the experimentation that metal can be would say, that's not metal, or I didn't know metal was that weird, or you're weird for listening to this garbage. So uh, maybe I am, but we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me. Check out these goddamn bands. <laughs>